Welcome back. Welcome to the illustrious return of Math for Game Developers. I'm really glad to be here. I was off touring Europe for a few months and we had a lot of fun. But now I'm back and we're going to be doing math and we're going to be doing a really interesting um, type of math that I'm really excited about getting into. Partially because it was developed by my man Euler. If you remember Euler from Euler angles, he was one of the first guys to develop this kind of math. And let's show you what it is. Let's say that you have a game like Civilization. Okay, and these green blobby blobby areas represent continents that your that your units are on. Okay? And you have cities here. We'll call this city Athens. And this city Carthage. And this city will be be, be Budapest. And the computer has units in Athens and he wants to attack Budapest and he wants to attack Carthage. But you can see that they are on different continents. Athens and Carthage are on different continents so you can't just walk your units over to Carthage to attack. You're gonna have to cross an ocean there. But between Athens and Budapest there is no water in real life. I think there actually is water between Athens and Budapest but no matter this is not real world. This is our fake game world that we generated. And so we want to know if there is an ocean between Athens and the city that we want to attack. Uh, pretending that we are programming the computer, we're programming the artificial intelligence that the computer uses. So you have to be able to, the computer has to be able to tell whether it needs ships to attack this other city. So that's what we're going to figure out. Here's the naive approach. We can just draw a line between the cities and see, well, is there water? Is there water anywhere along that line? If so, then we must be on a different continent. Well, that won't entirely work because you can see that Athens and Budapest are on the same continent, but there is water directly between them. There's water directly between them, which means that if we just use this naive line drawing solution, we're going to get false positives sometimes, and that's bad. So, instead of doing that, we're going to employ something called graphs. Graphs are not like, well, this is, this is also a graph of a sine wave, okay? But that's not the graph that I'm talking about. I'm talking about graph theory graphs. They were developed by our man Leonard Euler, and they look kind of like this. A graph is a series of nodes. These are nodes. Actually, I'm going to use the same color here for the nodes. Nodes. So this is a node, and this is a node. And these nodes are correct, con connected by edges edges. So this is an edge, and this is an edge, and this is an edge. These edges connect the nodes, and that's a graph. That's all it is. It's a mathematical way of representing a, a point that is connected to other point. The points being the nodes, and the edges being the connections. So, let's see if we can take this game world that has all of the continents and cities and represent it using a graph. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to split this game world up into regions. If you've played Civilization, you will, you will see that um, I can talk and draw at the same time. If you've played Civilization, then you'll see that the entire world is split up into squares. And so maybe each square would be a node on the graph. But here we're just going to do it a little bit simpler. We're going to just split it up arbitrarily like this. It actually looks more like more like Risk than, uh, than Civilization. But we'll get how to do it in Civilization a little bit later. So this continent, you can see, is made of three regions. 
three regions. One of them has Athens, one of them has Budapest, and the other is empty. So let's make each of these regions into a node. So this top region becomes a node, this left region will become a node, and this bottom region will become a node. The top region has Athens in it, so I'm going to put an A, and the bottom region has Budapest in it, so I'm going to put a B. And so now we've made nodes out of our continent. You can walk directly from this region into this region without passing through any other regions, so that is going to get an edge. These two nodes represent these two regions, and we're going to get an edge between them. Same thing down here. You can walk from this region into that region without passing through any other regions, so we're going to get an edge here as well. You cannot walk directly from the region with Athens in it into the region with Budapest in it without either walking through water or walking through this other region, so there will not be uh, an edge right here. Let's do it again for this continent on the right. This will be the region with Carthage. Carthage gets a C. And this will be, what color did I have? This will be, there will be some other regions here that get associated nodes. The positions of the nodes don't matter. All that matters is the organization of what nodes are connected by what edges. You can see you can get from this region to this region and that's represented by these two nodes so we're going to draw an edge right there. You can get from here to here so I'm going to draw an edge right there. But you cannot get from the top right region to the bottom left region without passing through these other regions so I'm not going to draw I'm not going to draw an edge between these two guys. You get through these two regions so I'm going to draw an edge right there. You can get to these two regions, so I'm going to draw an edge right there. And you can get from the top left region to the bottom right region, so I'm going to draw... Bam! We're done. We've completed our node graph that represents the continents that our, that our strategy game is playing on. And now you can really easily see, just by looking at this node graph, that there's no path from node A to node C or from node B to node C, but there is a path from node A to node B. And so, that is actually, we're going to formalize that in a later video that's called a graph connectedness algorithm, and that will give us a, a more rigorous way of telling which nodes are, are there exists a path from, from one node to the other. But for now, let's go to the code section, and we're going to look at how to implement graphs. Now here we are, we have our uh, graph class, but I should, I should make a disclaimer here that graphs, there's like a hundred different ways of implementing graphs. It's very subjective and it matters a lot on exactly what your current um, application is, what you're trying to do with the graphs. Which means we may not have as many graph, uh, as many code sections in this part of, of the, um, in this little mini series that we're doing on graphs. But that's okay, let's get the general idea here. We have a graph class. We can see it has an inner class that represents edges and an inner class that represents nodes. We'll get to the contents of those in a moment. And then we have add node, a method that just pushes a node onto our list of nodes. Simple enough. And then add edge, which we're gonna finish later. We have some getters. And then this is the, the way that the edges and nodes are stored in the, in the memory. We have two vectors, a vector of nodes and a vector of edges. Now remember vectors, vectors will automatically reallocate the memory if they grow too large. If you push a new node onto the stack of nodes and there's not enough memory, then vectors will automatically reallocate the memory for you, which means that if you have any pointers pointing to something in that vector, that pointer will be invalid once that vector reallocates itself, which could be at any time, which is why you should never have a pointer to something contained in a vector. Because of that, we're using integer offsets. Okay, When we add an edge, we're adding it between node A and node B, but these are integer offsets into this node list. 
that can make things a little bit confusing because your type checker isn't working for you anymore. Um, so with that in mind, <laughs> let's get started here. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to push a new node onto our list of nodes. This is a little bit of C++ syntax here, but it just means that this back means that we're getting the last item in the list of nodes, which is of course the one that we just added. Second B. So we've added our new edge. We've said that it's going to be between node A and node B, and now we have to inform node A that it has a new edge. What is the index of the edge? Size minus one will give us the index of the edge that we just added. So we'll do that again for node B, and that should be it. That should be all we have to do. Let's go down to the main function. And if we build it really quick and step into it, let's see what the debugger says about our node graph. Okay, We see that initially we have zero nodes and zero edges, size zero. And so if we add a node, then now we have one node, which has no edges, and we have zero edges. We add the rest of our nodes, Come on. Now we have three nodes, none of which have any edges. And of course we have no edges. So when we add a node, I'm sorry, an edge between node zero and node one, let's see how that affects what's in our memory. You can see that now the first two nodes, node zero and node one, list having edges, list having an edge zero. This value is zero because it's the first edge in the list. That doesn't mean that this edge points to node zero. This is why this um, this integer stuff can get confusing. And this is uh, maybe a drawback of the way I implemented this graph. Maybe if you want the nodes to point directly to the um, to the other edge instead of what am I saying here? If you want the edge to point to the other node instead of just to the edge, then you might implement this a different way. Um, so you really have to watch your P's and Q's when you're dealing with some of these implementations. All right, let's see what, uh, what the output here is. We're going to examine node zero to see how many edges it has. And it should have two because we added this edge to node zero and we added this edge to node zero. So there we go. Node zero has two edges. And then let's see what those edges are. For every edge, we're going to grab this edge zero is an index into the edge list. So we have to get edge zero and then print out its first and second nodes. And we see that it has an edge that goes between node zero and one. Now, node zero is the node we're looking at right now. So we don't care about that. We care that node zero points to node one. And then if we do it again, we see that it has another edge that goes between nodes zero and two. Okay, that can get a little bit involved, but as you're gonna see in the next video when we cover graph connectedness algorithms, it can be very powerful in helping us doing pathfinding. So we'll see you next week.